Sorry, yeah. I just needed to concentrate on Sorry, yeah, yeah. You, you're going to be at six? Yeah. Awesome.
Well, hello everyone. Welcome to church. Before we begin, just need to make a few announcements. As you're probably well aware, uh, we have additional restrictions on us uh, this weekend. Uh, hopefully it will just be for this weekend and nothing else will progress on the COVID front. Uh, but I do want to tell you that masks are again mandatory uh, while you're indoors. Uh, so please keep your mask on the whole time. Us up front as we speak, we'll have to take them off, but we'll put them on back again. Uh, and that's mandatory for anyone over the age of 12. Sadly, again, we can't sing. It's very sad because God's people are meant to sing. Uh, we have so much to sing about. We have the Lord Jesus. We have the future of heaven, uh, but we can't sing. So uh, I will ask you to, at the points where we'll have our song, we've cut down to two songs instead of three. We'll stand in faith with our band as they lead us in that and as we reflect on the words, uh, but even with masks, uh, please do not sing. And uh, we've been trying to bring our kids uh, back into church as we once did, but uh, of course we've been derailed in that for now. And so if you have any kids, uh, take them off to their programs uh, right now, but kids won't be able to join us for that. But uh, welcome to church anyway. Uh, despite these restrictions, God's word is not bound. We will still hear his word. Uh, Mike Turner, our acting rector, is going to preach to us in that book of Ezekiel that we've been starting. I uh, hope you've been enjoying that so far. Even though it's a strange book, there's a lot of strange things there. And Ezekiel is going to do very, very strange things again uh, this morning. Uh, we'll learn lots about uh, who God is and what he expects of us and, and what, he, what he is like uh, when we uh, fail to live up to his expectations. But of course, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers especially. I uh, hope you've had a good, possibly crazy morning if you've got younger kids. Uh, we certainly did in our household. Uh, but of course, Mother's Day isn't uh, always a great time for everyone. And we do want to acknowledge that. And so let's spend some time in prayer, for prayer for our mothers in our congregation, but also for those uh, who are motherless, but also for those who are mothers in the faith as well. Please. Uh, pray with me. O oh Lord God, we know that you hear us and answer us, and we trust you enough to answer these prayers according to your plans. And thank you that you value women. Thank you for creating women in the way that you have planned to fulfill various relational roles. Sisters, daughters, wives, mothers, granddaughters, grandmothers, and spiritual mothers. Lord, in relation to motherhood, we thank you for the special role that you give to women to bear children. We pray that those who are mothers will fulfill that role in a way that honors you. Please enable them to raise children and grow them into adulthood. Show these mums how to grow their children spiritually in the love of Jesus. For those that enjoy motherhood and find great happiness in it, we thank you. For those who are tired, fed up, lacking motivation, Please give them what is lacking. Lord, if help seems slow, and give them patience and a faithfulness that comes from you. And for those that are finding it difficult to conceive or are having difficult pregnancies, please give them perseverance and people around them who are sensitive and caring enough to know how to listen. We pray for those that find days like today difficult for various reasons. For those that are separated from significant women in their lives, Please help them to acknowledge the loss and to come to you to fill the gap. Please provide for them emotionally in ways that only you can provide. Oh Lord, for those women that are ill, either mentally, emotionally, or physically, please give them relief. Lord, for those that are single, whether never married or single through divorce, separation, or death, please give these women significant relationships that grow and encourage them in their lives, both spiritually and emotionally. And for those that are married, please give their husbands the insight, wisdom, and action that grows their wives towards spiritual maturity and shows them deep love and care. For those of us here who are spiritual mothers, please continue to give us the wisdom to know how to encourage spiritual daughters in the faith, provide time to meet and pray and read your word so that both can be mutually encouraged. Father God, please help us to give thanks whatever our situation. Help us to thank other women in our lives that we appreciate 
to bring them encouragement. Ultimately, we thank you for giving us new life and new birth through the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. We pray this in his name. Amen. And that's exactly what we're going to sing about, well, hear the band sing about right now, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our behalf. Please stand with the band. please join with me in prayer with the words on our screen together almighty god creator and redeemer we praise you for the beauty of the world around us and for every gift we enjoy thank you for creating us to know you to love you and to obey you most of all we praise you for your amazing love in sending your son to restore your world by dying for us and rising to give us new life. Accept our praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, it's time to go through a bit of our church family news, and we have a few here. The first, of course, is the Thanksgiving lunch for the ministry of Stuart and Julie Pearson. Of course, Stuart, um, after his uh, stroke in, uh, I believe, March last year, 
Um, he's been uh, quite unwell since, and he's had to uh, resign uh, his position as our rector. But uh, we have so much to give thanks for, for the ministry uh, he's done for us and, and what God has done uh, through him and Julie in uh, taking care of our church all this time for the last 26 uh, years. And so uh, please be coming to that lunch. Uh, all we need right now is uh, RSVPs with uh, allergies, those kind of details, so we make sure we know what to cater for. Uh, the sign-up sheet is just right outside, and if you can just say how many in your family, uh, what allergies you might have, uh, please put that out, and we'll know what numbers there are. But please book in that date, the 29th of May, and that's a Saturday right here at 11 a.m. The second event that we'd love for you to consider coming to is uh, Stu Woods, our community chaplain's uh, supporters dinner. Uh, his role is one of those roles that not many people can do, and one of those roles that we need to keep funding for. Uh, unfortunately, it's something that's uh, just not a given in, in uh, many of our systems to, to provide for people like him, and we need to make sure we keep supporting his ministry. So could you please, if you don't know what he does, please come to that dinner. If you'd like to support him, please come to that dinner. If you just want to pray for him, please come to that dinner. And if you want to consider financially partnering with him in his work there, please come to that dinner, the 5th of June. That's Saturday again at 6 p.m. Now, in uh, wider church news, uh, you might realize that we have a, a new archbishop now. Uh, the Diocese of Sydney has been very blessed in having had to decide between four candidates over this week. They all loved the Lord Jesus, and that's not regular in a lot of dioceses, actually. And they've all served Jesus for many, many faithful years. But in the end, the name that our synod has elected to take up the role of Archbishop of Sydney is Kanishka Raffel. Here's a little uh, bit about him, in case you don't know him. And Mr. Raffel has been the Dean of Sydney for six years, previously leading a large Anglican church in Perth for 16 years. Kanishka and his wife Kaylee have been married for 32 years and have two adult uh, daughters. He is 56. Born to Sri Lankan parents in London, Mr. Raffel and his family emigrated to Australia from Canada in 1972. As a convert to Christianity from Buddhism, the Archbishop-elect has a special passion for explaining the Christian gospel and teaching the Bible. And I believe he's a, a good a childhood friend of Stuart's as well. And so I'm sure we'll get to know him uh, better soon. Uh, but for now, uh, let's pray for him and his family as he prepares to take up this new role in serving Jesus uh, and our church in that way. Please, pray with me. Sovereign Lord, you are the God of grace and truth, whose word is life and whose strength is perfected in gentleness. We praise you for your patient care for your church, the way you hold us tenderly in your embrace and gently lead us forward. And despite our weaknesses and sins, our misplaced priorities, foolish confidences, and selfish preoccupations, you bear with us and bear us on. You lift us up and dignify us with your service. You set our faces to the way ahead and our hands to the work. We give you heartfelt thanks that now again you have raised up an overseer for your people in Sydney who knows and loves you, Kanishka Raffle. We praise you for his many gifts and for the evident and beautiful work you have done in his life. And so we receive the news of his election with the joyful knowledge of your never exhausted care and provision for us. And now, Lord, we ask you by your spirit to fill your servant with new power and fresh zeal for the good news of Jesus Christ. Give him new wisdom, love, and self-discipline. Teach him once again the sufficiency of Christ and the joy of his service. Sustain him and his family for the work ahead and give them the help they need. Use his ministry to enable your church in Sydney and throughout the world to stand firm in one spirit and to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's our wonderful privilege to stand side by side in partnership together for the one faith, for the one faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it's also our joy right now to articulate that faith as we say the Apostles' Creed together. And so could I please ask you now to stand with me? Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Please take your seats. Uh, now, Marion was uh, going to be here to lead us in prayer for the leadership at St. Luke's, but unfortunately she's unwell, and so I'm going to pray with her words on her behalf. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, your voice may be heard by all who are needed for service of God in his church at St. Luke's. Fill our leaders' hearts with grace to obey and with humility to lead your children ever closer to your side. Show to all leaders the spirit of true thankfulness for their calling and unwavering faith through all times of doubt or difficulty that your will may be done on earth as in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for all who serve in leadership roles and bring before you our acting senior minister, Mike Turner, our associate minister, Ez Lau, our children's minister, Ed Frost, our community chaplain, Stu Woods, our Bible study leaders, Little Lambs, and many more who have various leadership roles here at St. Luke's. Heavenly Father, your word declares that we will not be afraid nor dismayed because you are our God. We pray for leadership guidance for every leader at St. Luke's. I pray that they will exercise faith knowing that you will strengthen them and help them. You, Lord, will uphold them with your righteous hand. So thank you in advance for your divine strength for all our leaders. Thank you for your guidance. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And will you continue in prayer with me together in the Lord's Prayer? Together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, Jesus himself said, before he went to the cross, that his kingdom is not of this world. But even now, we see his kingdom as we see his children respond to him respond to his word. And so before we read for ourselves what he has in store for us in his Bible today, let's pray together that we might be ready to hear his word. Together. Gracious God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Today, when we hear your voice, deliver us from hardness of heart. Help us to put away everything that keeps us from persevering in your way. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Russell's going to come up now to read for us our two Bible readings. 
We're, of course, reading Ezekiel chapter 4 and 5. Uh, that's the focus of our sermon. But first of all, we're going to be reading Amos. We've been in Amos for a while now, and uh, most of you have realized it is a truly depressing book. Not because God doesn't have great things to say to us, but it is a, a book all about God's patience running out. But even in such a horrific book, so much about judgment, we see this wonderful glimmer of hope that we actually see fulfilled in the Lord Jesus here at the end of Amos. And then Russell's going to read for us Ezekiel 4 to 5 after Amos. Thank you, Russell. Okay, the first reading is Amos 9, 11 to 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and, re and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the ploughman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Okay, the second reading is Ezekiel chapter 4 and 5. Now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it. Set up camps against it and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan... Place it as an iron wall between you and the city and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. Then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also, measure out a sixth of a hin of water and drink it at set times. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said, in this way the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Then I said, Not so, sovereign Lord. I have never defiled myself from my youth until now. I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. He then said to me, Son of man, I'm about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. The people 
will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair. For food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and will waste away because of their sin. Chapter 5. Now, son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Then take a set of scales and divide up the hair. When the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city and scatter a third to the wind. For I will pursue them with drawn sword. But take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Again, take a few of these and throw them into the fire and burn them up. A fire will spread from there to all Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the centre of the nations, with countries all around her. Yet in her wickedness she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you and have not followed my decrees or kept my laws. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself am against you, Israel, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations. Because of all your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. Therefore, in your midst, parents will eat their children and children will eat their parents. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all your survivors to the wind. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will shave you. I will not look upon you with pity or spare you. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls and a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. Then my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. And, then I ha and when I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you in the sight of all who pass by. You will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and an object of horror to the nations around you when I inflict punishment on you in anger and in wrath and with stinging rebuke. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you and they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Thank you, Russell. That was a very heavy reading, and so we need to come and pray as we come to God's Word. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning as we come to this heavy word from you of judgment that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to know you, and hearts to love you more and to live for your honour and glory. Amen. Well, it was a beautiful 
day, a weekday in October, a sunny day, and I was riding my bike to university as I did, and it was a whole lot of fun, and I was almost at university, and everything was going well, and I'm thinking through what I need to do that day and head to lectures and all that, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> I ran into a car on my bike, smack bang right into the front driver's fender over the wheel there. Um, it was very painful. The ambulance ride was not particularly fun. Uh, but the worst thing was that it was my fault. I was riding the wrong way in the car park and so hit the car, which was normally coming out, and so I was the one who was responsible for the $900 of the panel, was responsible for fixing my own bike and responsible for the ambulance and the $50 fine I got from the police for negligent bicycle riding. So there you go which is an interesting conversation with the constable who uh, gave me that fine. A couple of years ago, I was driving home in my car uh, with my student minister at the time, and we'd just been playing squash with some guys from church, and I was so tired, and as I'm reversing my car into the driveway, I reversed straight into his car whilst he was next to me. He was very gracious and loving, but there was that conversation with the insurance company, wasn't it? Which starts out nice. Are you okay? That must be horrible. But of course, actions have consequences, don't they? And that cost quite a lot of money with the excess there. Um, when I got the car back, three weeks later, we was driving into Sydney University to drop my daughter and the family, the whole family, my parents included, off at the Seymour Centre to do the ballet performance, and I went and parked the car. And I was very aware of this massive Kia Carnival, if some of you have them, you know how big they are, uh, parking in an in inner city, city car park, and I'm reversing in very carefully, very carefully, very carefully, and then all of a sudden, again! <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, like, I was like, how could this happen? What's happened? The inner city car parks, you know they're kind of like a half-level car park? like this, and then the next level sort of juts out with this concrete thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, our car has this fantastic windscreen wiper on the back. I had successfully parked the car into that with the windscreen wiper, which then exploded the, wind, the rear windshield. Um, and so it wasn't just a windshield replace, it was a whole component replace, which meant, of course, you needed to contact the insurance again. Hello, Mr. Turner. Hello. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Um, oh, and it was your fault? Yes, it was my fault. Oh, I see you made a claim. Yes, yes, I did this three weeks ago. Back to the same smash repairers. Three weeks later, of course, the, the uh, insurance was due. And all of a sudden, all those great driving credits that I'd earned, all those discounts that I'd earned, I was treated like a normal bad driver that I was. The point is, <laughs> actions have consequences. For some of you, uh, it's more than just a silly little accident in a car, as expensive and embarrassing as that is, but some of us know very much that our actions have consequences. We've lived them out, haven't we? Well, as Ez has said, we're continuing our series in Ezekiel, and the series is called Seeing God in the Ashes. Last week, Ez took us through God's call of Ezekiel, and the call that he would go to a rebellious people who wouldn't listen. How's that for a job advertisement? Not only that... But the week before that, we saw God's glory as Ezekiel and some of the exiles are in a foreign land and God shows up with a message that he has for them. This week, we hear about God's judgment. And as Russell heard, I'm sure you probably felt weight after weight after weight of judgment that God is bringing on his people. And so let's get started with our first point. Point number one, signs of judgment. Verse 1 of chapter 4, God says, Now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel." God speaks to Ezekiel and he says you are to do four sign acts. 
Basically, I like to think of it as kids' talks. He needs to do these kids' talks, which involves a block of clay lying on his side, some sort of weird food cooking sort of thing, and also some hair. Because God wants his people to know very clearly this is what is going to happen. Ezekiel is in Babylon, but most of the people are still back in Jerusalem, back in God's land that hasn't, they haven't been brought out yet. And kids' talk number one is the block of clay. Ezekiel needs to get a block of clay, set it up, and basically make like a mini fort and put some, you know, sticks or whatever around it. And it's, it's, it's living out the siege. Now, maybe you've done this or maybe your kids do this all the time, maybe in a sand pit or in the sand or you get the mud together or whatever it is. The point is, he's supposed to make what it's going to look like, kind of like a little siege work play. And the message is, it's going to be terrible. And not only that, but he needs to put this iron pan between him and the city. And that's supposed to symbolise God as a firm and impenetrable barrier between him and his people. The point is that God himself will bring an army against his people, against his city. God will prevent anyone from saving them. He will be the iron pan between them and any salvation. But what's the big deal with Jerusalem? Now, we've talked about Jerusalem before, and you probably already know, but Jerusalem was the geopolitical, it was the geographical and the spiritual centre of Israel. It was the heartbeat, the centre. And Ezekiel had been taken out to Babylon, but there's still people there because Babylon hasn't fully destroyed them yet. But if, it's, if Jerusalem falls, if the heartbeat of the nation falls, then it's as if God's promises have failed. It's as if they're not God's people anymore. And yet God is saying that he will come and bring judgment against them. It's a big sign if that city falls. It's a bit like when the capital of America was besieged in January this year when the people broke in and sat in the seat and all that sort of stuff. In and of itself, the building just a building, but it symbolised American democracy. It symbolised order and power and it seemed like everything had gone crazy. So Kids Talk 1... Mud pies, clay things, having fun. Maybe what your kids will do afterwards. Kids talk number two, lying on his side. Ezekiel needs to lie on his side for over a year, 390 days, and then flip over and lie for 40 days on the other side. Now, he's probably not doing this 24-7. He's probably doing it for maybe like the whole length of the day or, or something like that and going elsewhere. Now, I kind of get the block clay thing, right? It makes sense, you know, models, army, that sort of stuff. That's fine. But I don't know about you, but lying on your side for like a long time every day is just kind of weird. Can we agree to that? That's just weird. Can you imagine if you came into the church office in a couple of years, maybe in a year's time, and the new senior minister's there? I don't know any names, so I've made up a name, Bobby Junior, Bobby Jojo Junior. Um, if the nominators let me know that that is one of the names, I will change it. But for now, Bobby Jojo Junior is in his office. And you go in and you say, you know, Bobby Jojo Jr., how's it been going this last year? Oh, Mike, it's been fantastic. You know, I'm a guy who goes, one thing, I do one thing really well, not a whole lot of little things on the side. Okay, Bobby Jojo Jr., what have you, what have you been doing this last year? Well, I come into the office and then I lay down on my side. And? No, 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 that's what I do. Like, that's just what you do? Yeah. He's like, well, that explains the sermons, but, you know, what, what do you, why? Oh, and here's the kicker, in two months' time, I'm going to switch and lay on my other side. So, uh, that would be weird, wouldn't it? If your minister just did that or came and lay down here or something like that. What's the point? The point is the days symbolise years, right? 390 years, Israel has been rebelling against God. They've been sinning against him. They've been saying for 390 years, talk to the hand, God, because the face isn't listening. It'd be like going back to 1631 for us, 390 years ago. Imagine all that time, that rejection. Many of us know how hard it is to be treated like dirt and to be ignored for a moment or for a day, let alone for centuries. They looked like they were doing all the right things. They had the temple. 
They did the sacrifices. They did the feast. They did all the right religious things on the outside, but on the inside, their hearts were far from God. Friends, maybe that's some of us here. We do all the right religious things on the outside, but maybe our heart is far from God. The whole time, God has been patiently enduring, patiently calling his people back. The fact that he sends prophets again and again, even in bringing judgment, is a sign of God's grace that he hasn't given up on his people. God has not been fast in bringing judgment. He hasn't flown off the handle like so many of us do when we get angry. The 40 days are the 40 years of judgment coming on Israel. God's people have rebelled a long time and judgment is coming. There's no escaping it. Kids talk number three, mixed up food. Ezekiel needs to get his master chef on and he needs to get some pretty funky inner west ingredients. We're in the inner west for eight years. This feels like something you'd read on a cafe thing there. Maybe a hipster paleo diet loaf or some ridiculous rubbish like that. Something that would cost you $30 and it would be kind of this sort of big. Wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet and spelt. Bonus marks if you even know what half of those things look like, let alone how to make them. But the point is that judgment that will come against Israel will be so bad that people will need to rustle around and try and find whatever they can. It's an extreme form of leftover night. You know what it's like when you you can't be bothered cooking or you haven't been shopping and you go through the fridge and you gather everything together before it expires and you go through the pantry and you gather everything together and then you feed your family like 15 different meals all one bite at a time because you need to kind of survive Daddy, what's for dinner? Anything you can find. It's a free-for-all. Just eat something. We read in verse 17, For food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and will waste away because of their sin. Not only will they have barely enough food and they have to ration water, but they'll have to resort to desperate measures to cook it. They'll have to cook over poo in verses 12 to 15. A certain staff member who will remain nameless, uh, was very keen for this series because when it came to the kids' church activities, this staff member wanted to do some really cool things in the kids' church. I don't know what they're doing right now. (laughs) But that's leadership, you delegate it, right? Yeah. So um, you may, uh, no, no, they're not doing that. Cooking, cooking poo over food makes it unclean, particularly for the Israelites, right? It's a symbol of them being unclean in a foreign land. Things are not good. And so the point is that as Ezekiel eats this food over poo, the point is that God's people will be physically starving and spiritually unclean. It sucks. Kids talk number four, hair, at the start of chapter five. Ezekiel needs to take part in the world's greatest shave before it was a thing. He needed to get his hair and his beard shaved off. Now, if some of us were doing it, let's be honest, gentlemen, some of us, this would be a very quick process because God has blessed us for this ministry by the lack of hair that we have. But in those days, to be shaved was a sign of humiliation and suffering. You really get the idea that being a prophet like Ezekiel was a really sucky job. He was called to go to rebellious people who would not listen There were no encouraging emails. Thanks for the sermon this week. Preacher, prophet Ezekiel really touched me. They weren't even listening. He had to lie on his side. He had to eat a questionable diet. And now he's publicly humiliated. And Ezekiel needs to divide his hair into three parts. To divide it, uh, a third to be burnt, a third to be struck with a sword, and a third to be thrown to the wind. The hair, of course, represents God's people. And what God will do in his deliberate and careful measurement of judgment. Notice that God intentionally divides. It's not just some haphazard thing. He's intentional and focused in what he's doing. A third of it will be burnt in the fire. That is the people who will be destroyed when the city falls. A third of it will be struck by the sword, which is the violent death for those who do escape the city, but who are killed. And then a third will be scattered to the wind. Those who do survive, who will be scattered into Babylon and elsewhere, because they are cast out. The point of all these kids' talks, these four signs, is that judgment is coming. And God's people, 
is coming on them and it will be terrible, it will be total, and then it comes directly from God's hand. But why is God bringing these terrible judgments on his people? Well, that's our second point, point number two, reasons for judgment. And we pick it up in verse 5 of chapter 5. This is what the sovereign Lord says, This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the centre of the nations, with countries all around her. Yet in her wickedness she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Verse 8, Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations. Why will God judge his people? Well, in verse 5, we read that God had made his people a special people. He had called them out of slavery. He had saved them. He had chosen Abraham when he had nothing to contribute, when he was a pagan in a foreign land. He'd given them his good news. He'd showed them how best to live in this world. God had done all of these things. He'd showered love and grace and mercy upon them. And the nations were supposed to come to them as a light. They were supposed to come and be blessed and through them be a blessing to all to find out about God. And yet in verses 9 and 11, they who have God's residence defile God's holy place with images and detestable practices. We'll hear about this next week more. Instead of responding with thankfulness and joy and obedience, what did they do? They rebelled against God. They rejected his way to live. And if that wasn't bad enough, they actually sought to be worse than the other nations who hadn't heard from God. They wanted to be the best at being the worst. They wanted the biggest trophy of being the worst they outdid themselves and they kept boasting about how good they were and inventing new ways about just how far away they were running from God imagine that going to someone's house here is my trophy about how I am the worst employee at my work how I am the worst child in my family and it's proudly displayed and because of their actions there will be consequences but far worse consequences than driving accidents or anything else that we can imagine. And over the next three weeks, we'll hear just how bad sin is and that the, the punishment does fit the crime. We'll see how sin is idolatry, how sin is adultery and how sin is pride. All of those things in that mini sort of sin series, we will see just how bad it is. But for now, imagine if this was you. You love and care for someone. You put yourself out for them. You make them special and all they do is throw it back in your face. Maybe some of you know what this is like. And so what will this judgment look like for Israel? It's pretty bad. Parents eating children and vice versa in verse 9. God inflicting punishment in verse 10. Survivors being scattered in verse 10. God spending his wrath on them in verse 13. Ruin and reproach among the nations in verse 14. The nations will look on them with an object of horror in verse 15. They will be shot with God's deadly and destructive arrows for the sole purpose of destroying them in verse 16. God will bring more and more famine upon them in verse 16. Famine and wild beasts will be against them in verse 17. They will be left childless in verse 17. Plagues and bloodshed will sweep through them in verse 17. And sword will be brought against them in verse 17. Everything will be taken away from them and everything and everyone will be against them. The worst part by far of Ezekiel 4 and 5 is not those, but in verse 8 where God says, I myself... I'm against you. God is rightly angry and full of wrath. He will not look on them with pity or spare them. The worst news is that the God of the universe, their loving God, is against his people. We're told later in the book of Hebrews that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God as one of his enemies. Friends, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is very clear, do not get on the wrong side of God because the fate is far worse than you ever could have dreaded. 
Of course, some of us may be sitting here thinking, you know, Mike, this just proves that the God of the Old Testament is an angry, wrathful, thunderbolt God, while the God of the New Testament is a loving, lamb-hugging, happy sort of God. But the God of the Bible is the same God, Old Testament and New Testament. And it's actually in the New Testament where Jesus ups the ante. He makes the Old Testament look pale in comparison. In the Old Testament, like Ezekiel, judgment and punishment is just limited to this life. When you get to Jesus, he talks about judgment and punishment into eternity. He talks about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. As bad as it sounds today, in Ezekiel, Jesus makes judgment eternal. The same God. And as we get to Jesus, we understand just how bad it is. It is a devastating picture and it's no surprise that God's judgment is not a popular message. We live in a culture that says everyone is special and in God's image we are, but it's almost impossible to give any slightly negative feedback to anyone. We don't even call it negative feedback anymore. We call it constructive, uplifting, fluffy, marshmallow, rainbow something. Parents are outraged at teachers if they're told what their child is really like at school and that maybe what's happening at home is transferring to the classroom and that maybe, just maybe, it's not always the teacher's fault. To even question some of our culture's messages about identity or meaning and purpose is met with vehement opposition. It's classed as hate speech. We've lost the art of respectful disagreement And here you are, Mike, preaching through Ezekiel in these devastating chapters of judgment with God saying, you are wrong. You are an enemy. You are a rebel. There is judgment. There are consequences for turning your back on the living God. And it's not just Israel, it's us too. What a terrible message, Mike. How unloving. You cannot expect me. You're you're paid to do it at least, but no way. But friends, if people don't know how bad their problem is, then how in the world will they ever see their need for a saviour and the beauty and cost of the cross of Christ? Of course, there are ways to do this. It must be done with a heart for the loss and with tears. There is no joy in announcing judgment. And over the next three weeks, we'll look at the question, is God's judgment fair? Does the punishment fit the crime? But the reason we speak of the judgment and the punishment is because we have the good news. But for now, we turn to our third point, point number three, hope through judgment. Verse three of chapter five. But take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Verse 13. Then my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. And when I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. Remember, this is Ezekiel's kid. Kids talk about shaving his head and beard, dividing it up into three parts. And you may have noticed that some of the hairs are tucked away in Ezekiel's cloak. God gives his people a hair of hope. These symbolize the remnant of God's people, the people God will spare, not because they are great or amazing or super religious, but because God is gracious and loving and merciful and faithful to his promises. In 5.13, there will come a time where God's anger will be spent. God takes sin, he takes rejection, he takes rebellion seriously. He will deal with it, and that is actually a really good thing. God acts for the sake of his holy name, and it's only when it's been punished that he will save a few of his people. Friends, salvation in the Bible comes through judgment, not around judgment. And as we'll hear throughout Ezekiel, God is doing all of this so that his people, so that the nations will know that I am the Lord. That God is God. It is the Lord who speaks and acts to protect his holy name. But at this stage in Ezekiel, there is just a hair of hope. 
just a hair of hope. But how can God's judgment be dealt with? How are we any different from God's people? If we look to ourselves in the mirror and expose ourselves, we know what we're like. We know that God is not always number one in our lives. How are we different? How is our fate different? Well, the answer is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Ezekiel announced God's judgment but couldn't do anything about it. God sends Jesus to deal with our problem, to deal with the punishment that we deserve. Ezekiel lay on his side, putting the sin of Israel on himself. But he couldn't deal with Israel's sin. Jesus comes and bears God's wrath, takes the sin upon himself for us at the cross. He's under God's judgment. That's why he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Romans 3.25, Jesus is our propitiation, which is just a word that means he takes God's anger from us to him. God is no longer angry with us because Jesus has dealt with it. Ezekiel gave a hair of hope that salvation will come through judgment. Somehow, somehow, Jesus brings salvation through judgment at the cross. At the cross, we see God's justice and love meet. They are not opposed. The God who is holy is the God who loves. The God who judges is the God who saves through judgment. And so what does this mean for us now? Well, it means that we need to hear the real and present warning here too. Don't take God's patience for granted. God was patient with his people for almost 400 years. 2 Peter 3 verse 15 says, Bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation. The only reason Jesus hasn't come back is to give people time to turn to him. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, you need to know two things. You need to know that God is patient and giving you a chance to turn back to him to stop being in the path of the freight train of his judgment. Get off the tracks. But don't waste his patience because you are dealing with the living God. And all have fallen short of God's glory. All of us have dragged God's name through the mud and all of us are rightly under his anger. Don't have God as your enemy. Turn to him. Let Jesus be the one who takes God's judgment, not you. It's a free gift right here for you. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, know this. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Christ died for you. He took God's judgment, which is far greater, far worse, and far more eternal than the pages of Ezekiel. And now we can live in assurance of our forgiveness. God is not angry with us if we are believers, He is our loving Father. We can live for him now and we can build one another up. Don't we need each other at times to lift our eyes to the hope that Jesus gives? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. How good is our God. May we continue to live in this assurance and share this wonderful good news of the God who saves through judgment as we see at the cross of Christ. Amen.
before we sing our final song, our song in response to what we've heard from God's Word this morning, I uh, just want to let you know, first of all, that there is no morning tea. Uh, we'll have a slide up saying go to morning tea, but please don't go to morning tea. There isn't one available. If you have a child in Croatia or Caterpillar Club, uh, please pick them up uh, straight away. That would be a great lot of help. But if you have a child in K C, uh, you'll meet them on the lawn there. We're going to hear our band uh, sing, and we will stand in faith of them, this life I live. Please stand. Rejoice in your greatness and power, your patience and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your Spirit to honor you in our thoughts, words, and actions, and to serve you in every aspect of our lives, filled with gratefulness for what you have done in the Lord Jesus Christ for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, please proceed outside. You'll be able to take your mask off there and please encourage each other on the lawn out there. Thank you. Mm-hmm.